The amount of substance topic in AQA A-level chemistry contains a huge amount of calculations and procedures, but there are still some key facts that you need to have learned. And this video is an opportunity to test yourself and check whether you do know those key facts or not. So download the questions from the description below, answer them, and then use this video to check your answers. There are a couple of different ways in which you can define relative atomic mass. Whether you prefer to talk about atoms or whether you prefer to talk about moles, either way is fine as long as you're being consistent with yourself within the definition. Whichever version you opt for, the relative atomic mass is a weighted average mass. In other words, it takes into account the different isotopes and what their relative proportions are. And it's compared to the reference standard, which is carbon-12. But since carbon-12 has a mass of 12, not a mass of 1, we say it's relative to 1 12th of the mass of the carbon-12 isotope. So you could either phrase your definition like this, or you could substitute the word mole for the word atom in both of the places there, and then it would still make sense and it would still be accurate and a valid definition. Relative molecular mass is represented by the symbol MR. And confusingly, this can be used to either represent relative molecular mass, if we're talking about a molecular substance, or relative formula mass, which is the name we use for the same idea when we're thinking about ionic substances. Relative molecular mass is, again, a weighted average mass of a molecule of a compound this time, rather than a single atom, relative to 1 12th of the mass of an atom of carbon-12. In other words, it's the mass of one mole of that substance in grams. One mole of any substance contains the same number of particles, namely 6.022 times 10 to the 23, which handily in the A-level exams they do actually give you, even though you had to memorise it for GCSE. That number is the Avogadro constant, or it's sometimes represented by the letter L. So if I know the number of moles, say I have five moles of hydrogen, then to work out how many molecules I've got, I would simply multiply this by Avogadro's constant. And that's the same whether we're talking about atoms or molecules or ions, it's just the same. Now, in order to work out the mass of a certain substance, I need to know the relative formula mass or the relative molecular mass, MR, because this is the mass of one mole in grams. So if I know the number of moles, I can multiply this by that relative formula mass or relative molecular mass to work out what the mass of the substance will be. To work out the percentage by mass of an element in a compound, I need to know the mass of the compound and the mass of that element. So I'm going to take the mass of the element within that compound, not just the relative atomic mass from the periodic table, but actually doubling up if there are two atoms per molecule, for instance, and divide that by the mass of the compound and multiply it by 100% to turn it into a percentage rather than a decimal. If I know the mass of a solute that's been dissolved in a solution, then in order to work out the concentration, the first thing I need to do is to work out the moles. And then in order to do that, I'm going to need to know the relative formula mass. So I firstly calculate the relative formula mass by simply adding together all of the relative atomic masses. And then I know that mass is Mr. Mole, or in other words, that mass is the relative formula mass multiplied by the number of moles. So I can rearrange that formula to calculate the number of moles. And this then allows me to work out that the concentration is the number of moles, which is represented by N, divided by the volume. Being careful, of course, that the volume must be in decimeters cubed, and it's often going to be given to you in centimeters cubed. So the relationship between centimetres cubed and decimetres cubed is that there are a thousand centimetres cubed in one decimetre cubed. And therefore, to convert between them, you're going to be dividing by a thousand to convert centimetres cubed to decimetres cubed, or much more rarely, multiplying by a thousand to go back the other way. Required practical one for A-level chemistry has two parts to it. So part A is where you're making the standard solution and part B is where you're doing the titration. And this can very easily come up as one of these six mark questions where you have to give a huge amount of detail for the method in order to get all six marks. So it's really worth making sure that you understand the whole process. To begin with, you're going to need to calculate the number of moles of the solute that you need to add. So for instance, if they've asked you for 250 centimetres cubed of one mole of solution, then you're going to be adding 0.25 moles. Then you can calculate the mass that should be added in order to make this solution. And you would do this by taking the relative formula mass and multiplying it by the number of moles. Once you know how much mass you're supposed to add, you can try to actually measure out that mass. 
So you want to use a high resolution balance because often the precise mass that you're trying to add is not going to be an integer or even to one or two decimal places and you want to get as close to it as humanly possible. You should be measuring this out using the before and after weighing method. So in other words, you're going to measure the mass of a weighing bottle or a weighing boat and then off the balance, you're going to put your solute into it because you don't want to risk spilling any on the balance and accidentally taking that into account when you do the, the weighing. Um, so then you measure the mass of um, the weighing bottle with your solute in it and then you empty it out and you measure the mass of the weighing bottle again. So that way you actually know how much of the solute you've added. You're not just sort of hoping that everything that you put into the weighing bottle came out. You dissolve that solute in a small amount of distilled water and this is usually going to require you to stir it with a glass rod to make sure that it actually dissolves. It may even be necessary to heat it gently in order to encourage that solute to dissolve. Once you've got the solute dissolved in that small volume of distilled water, then you can transfer it to a volumetric flask. And this is usually going to be a 250 centimeters cubed one, but they could give you a question where they um, request a slightly different volume. And in order to do that, you're going to probably use a funnel. It's then really important that you're rinsing out all of your glassware. So the beaker that you did the initial um, dissolving in and the rod that you've been stirring it with and the funnel you used to transfer it, because all of those things are going to have small amounts of solute left on them. So you rinse them with a wash bottle and then you transfer those rinsings to your flask so that as much of that solute as possible has actually gone into the volumetric flask. Then you're going to need to add more distilled water until you reach the calibration line. So when you get near to the end, you're going to use a dropping pipette because of course, as soon as you go past that calibration line, you can't go back, you can't remove any liquid. Um, you would just have to start all over again, which would be really depressing. So you add a dropping pipette at the end and you want the meniscus to be on the calibration line. And of course, you're always measuring at eye level. And then finally, you're going to stopper your volumetric flask and invert it several times. And the reason you're doing this is to homogenize your solution to make sure that it's really thoroughly mixed and the concentration is the same throughout. Because, of course, as soon as you start titrating with it, if you had bits that were more dilute and bits that were more concentrated, you would really struggle to get repeatable data. By measuring the mass before and after transferring the solute, we can determine the exact mass that's actually been transferred, rather than just assuming that all of the mass that was actually measured made it into the volumetric flask. We invert the volumetric flask in order to homogenize the solution and make sure that the concentration is consistent throughout it. The first step in your acid base titration is deciding which solution goes where. And the normal way of doing things is so that you have one thing that you know about each solution. So the solution that's added to the burette, you don't know what volume you're going to add. You just have to do the titration. So you do know the concentration. Before you can do the titration, you need to be sure that that burette doesn't contain any impurities. So it needs rinsing, but you can't rinse it with water because if you did, you would just dilute the solution that's in it. So instead, you rinse it with more of that same solution. So if you're going to titrate with sodium hydroxide, you rinse the burette with sodium hydroxide. It's also important that you run this through so that the air gap gets filled. If you didn't do this, then your first reading for your first titration would be artificially higher than it should, because the first couple of centimetres cubed are just going to go in and fill that air gap. It's also worth noting that a good way to improve the accuracy of your titration is to use a more dilute solution in the burette. This is because it's going to decrease the percentage uncertainty, because it's going to mean that all of the volumes that you're measuring are higher. It's also worth mentioning that before you start titrating, it's really important that you remove the funnel that you used to fill that burette. Because if you don't, then small droplets could drip from that funnel into your burette and you'd just be sort of adding in more liquid without realizing that's what you were doing. Once you have your burette set up, then you can use a volumetric pipette to measure 25 centimeters cubed of the solution that you don't know the concentration of. And that's going to go into a conical flask. You're using a conical flask rather than any other piece of glassware because it's going to allow you to swirl without any of the liquids splashing out. As with any of these measurements, where you're measuring a volume, it's important that you're measuring at eye level and that you're doing so from the meniscus. You're then going to add a couple of drops of an appropriate indicator to your conical flask. 
For the year 12 exams, you don't need to know how to pick that appropriate indicator, but by the time you take your year 13 exams, you need to know that the equivalence point and the end point need to be the same as each other, so that you have something that will actually change colour when, the, um, when you reach the equivalence point and the reaction actually stops. You're only going to add a few drops of that indicator because it does have a pH of its own and it will affect the titration. And you're going to use a white tile in order to more clearly see that colour change. You'll stop titrating when you see the first permanent colour change, and that's what we call the end point. So you're going to add the solution that's in the burette to the solution that's in the conical flask. And as you reach the end point, because you've done a rough titration, so you sort of know about when it's coming, um, you're going to start doing dropwise additions. So rather than adding maybe half a centimetre cubed in one go, you're just going to add individual drops. And after each addition, you're going to swirl to homogenise the solutions and see whether this colour change that you see is actually permanent or whether it dissipates as more of it reacts. As you go along, you're also going to rinse the sides of the conical flask and the outside of the burette with a wash bottle. And this is going to make sure that any solution that has come out of the burette is actually making it into the conical flask. Because otherwise, you would be measuring a volume that was artificially high because not everything was actually going and reacting. You continue the titration until you have concordant data. And this means two readings that are within 0.05 centimetres cubed of each other. This is also a good point to point out that your titers should be recorded to two decimal places, but that the second decimal place is always going to be either a zero or a five. The end point of the titration is where you see the first permanent colour change. And provided you've picked an appropriate indicator, that should be happening at the same time as the equivalence point, which is the point at which all of the solution in the conical flask has been neutralised. We can't rinse the burette with water because doing so would affect the concentration of the reagent in it. And that would mean that we weren't able to accurately calculate the number of moles that were being used to neutralise the solution in the conical flask. The wash bottle is used to ensure that all of the solution that has left the burette is making it into the conical flask and participating in that reaction. The meniscus is the lowest part of that curved upper surface of a liquid. So if you imagine what a burette looks like, then the liquid will curve up at the sides and the meniscus is the bottom part of that. It's not the bits where it's curving up at the sides and touching. So if you get one of those one mark multiple choice questions where it asks you to read off the volume, you need to make sure that you're reading the bottom of that. Titers should always be reported to two decimal places where the second decimal place is a zero or a five. The ideal gas equation is PV equals NRT and pressure is measured in pascals. It's often given to you in the question in kilopascals, and so you will need to convert. The standard pressure is 100,000 pascals. Volume is measured in metres cubed, and this is a big one that catches students out because you're so used to converting to decimetres cubed for titrations and concentrations, but for the ideal gas equation, we need metres cubed instead. Temperature is measured in Kelvin, and the standard temperature is 298 Kelvin. The empirical formula of a compound is the simplest whole number ratio of the elements that are in that compound. Whereas the molecular formula hasn't been simplified, so it actually tells you how many atoms of each type are in a compound. If you know the empirical formula and you know the relative formula mass, then you can use these together to work out the molecular formula. First, you need to work out what the conversion factor is. So basically, how many times bigger is the relative formula mass of the molecular formula compared to the relative formula mass of the empirical formula? So to take an example, if we said that we have an empirical formula of CH2 and that compound has a relative formula mass of 70, firstly, I need to know, well, what would the relative formula mass of CH2 be? And that's 14. Then I need to say, well, how many times bigger is 70 than 14? So 70 divided by 14 is 5. In other words, I need something that's five times bigger than my empirical formula. So if I multiply CH2 by 5, I get C5H10. If you've got abundance data, the easiest way to work with this is to essentially pretend that you have 100 grams of compound. So let's say I'm told that a particular compound contains 86% carbon and 14% hydrogen. Pretend you've got 100 grams. Now that's 86 grams of carbon and 14 grams of hydrogen. So now you use masses, Mr. Mole, 
to work out how many moles you have. So 86 divided by 12 to give me moles of carbon and 14 divided by 1 to give me moles of hydrogen. That gives me 7.17 and 14. So if I put 7 and 14 in a ratio to each other, usually it'll be a little bit closer than this. I haven't picked the best numbers in the world here. Then if I simplify that ratio, I get 1 to 2 and therefore I can give a formula of CH2. That's my empirical formula. And remember, if a question asks you to give an empirical formula, you have to actually give your answer in the form of a molecular formula. It can't just be left in, in the ratio of one to two. The limiting reactant is the one that is completely exhausted when the reaction is completed. This isn't necessarily the less abundant reactant because it's possible if the reactants are not reacting in a one-to-one -one ratio to have more moles of a certain reactant, but that still not be enough to react with the other reactant. The reactant that isn't limiting is called the excess. To work out the limiting reactant, we firstly need to work out the number of moles. So say if I have A reacting with B, then I can work out the moles of each one by doing the mass divided by the relative formula mass. If I was looking at solutions reacting rather than masses of solids, then instead I could use the number of moles is concentration multiplied by volume. So then I need to look at the coefficients in the chemical equation. So here I've got two moles of A reacting with three moles of B. So then I can consider these coefficients and divide the moles by these factors. At that point, I can then look at them and say, well, now which one is there less of? And whichever one there is less of now is going to be my limiting reactant. The yield of a reaction is the amount of product that is made in that reaction. And when working out what the maximum theoretical yield is, we need to use the limiting reactant to do so. It doesn't matter if there's five times as much of the excess reactant. If it hasn't got anything to react with, it can't react, and therefore it can't influence the yield of the product. A chemical reaction may not achieve its maximum expected theoretical yield if it's a reversible reaction and it's reached equilibrium rather than going to completion. Or, of course, the reaction may just not reach completion because it's quite slow. It's also possible for the reactants to take place in side reactions. So, for instance, when something is oxidised rather than reacting with the other reactant. And then it's also possible that sufficient product was made but actually it was lost in the extraction process so if you think about industrial processes there could be product left in the pipes or left in the reaction vessels and so that's going to influence the percentage yield as well to calculate percentage yield we look at the mass of the product that has actually been made and divide that by the mass of the product that we were expecting to make in other words the maximum theoretical yield and then multiply that by 100 percent in order to make it into a percentage Atom economy is a measure of what proportion of the reactants that we put in actually made it into a useful product. The number one reason to care about atom economy is economics. The more of your reactants that you're actually using usefully, the more product you're going to make. But you also might care because you're interested in the environment and you don't want to be extracting materials that aren't actually going into a useful product and they're just being wasted. And also ethically, it's not great to be wasting scarce resources. To calculate percentage atom economy, we take the molecular mass of the desired product and divide it by the sum of the masses of all reactants and multiply that by 100%. However, on a practical note, I would personally be dividing by the mass of the products rather than the reactants, because the law of conservation of mass tells you that the mass of the products and the mass of the reactants is going to be exactly the same as each other. So if you've already gone to the trouble of working out the mass of one of the products because it's the useful one and it's going to be the numerator of this equation, then it's going to be less effort to work out the total mass of all the products than the reactants. And that's just going to save you 30 seconds or a minute in the exam, which is always a good thing. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found that a useful addition to your revision for the amount of substance topic. If you did find it useful, then let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry content coming soon.